shortly after graduating from college, I began doing full-time ministry in a local church as a director of college ministry and outreach. Having been so encouraged by my time in what was known as Pace Christian Fellowship, when I became a Christian in college, soon thereafter I joined Pace Christian Fellowship. Having been so encouraged by that, I wanted to be a part of starting something like that on a college in Staten Island. Well, in the process of seeking to do that, I found a kind of partner in ministry, a student from a particular college who had a similar passion to see college students reached with the gospel. We started a Christian club at a college on this island together. We prayed together. We did outreach together. Oftentimes, I would teach when we would have the gatherings, and he would lead in times of worship. He even was a part of some of the student meetings that we had at the church where I served. On rare occasions, he would come and be a part of that. And generally speaking, we just enjoyed, and I know I enjoyed, just talking to him and talking about the things of God together. In many ways, for me, it was a blessed season. As time went on, and my ministry responsibilities changed at the church where I was serving, and they expanded. We didn't keep in contact as much, and our paths didn't cross as much. You can imagine my surprise then when, after having not seen him for a while, I was told by someone, and then shortly thereafter, shortly thereafter told by him, that he had abandoned the faith. If you had put me in the awkward position of listing the top 50 people that I thought could apostatize. I probably wouldn't answer because it's a really weird question to ask someone. So don't ask someone that. But if you put me in that really weird position and said, who are the top 50 people that you think would be most likely to apostatize? I probably wouldn't answer. But if I did answer, I would not have thought him. I would not have listed him anywhere near the top 50. The impetus for his departure was the death of his unrepentant grandmother. We prayed so many times for her. And I could only imagine how many times he prayed. And when she died without expressing faith in Christ, it was as though he said, enough is enough. It's as though he said, this stuff isn't true. I've been praying for her and praying for her and praying for her, and it didn't happen. So you know what? I am done with this Christianity. Now, during the time of our fellowship together and doing ministry, I had not come around to the doctrine of God's sovereignty and election. And he hadn't, and subsequently I don't think he did afterwards. But when I knew him, I knew that was a big burden upon his heart. And it was striking to hear someone who I thought of as a friend tell me, and I spoke to him directly, and to tell me that he was done with Christ. I mean, it's startling when you hear that from a distance. Like if you see somebody who is like a preacher turned atheist, like somebody like Dan Barker, if you hear somebody like him, it's startling from a distance to hear somebody like that say that they have turned against the faith that they once preached. But to see someone that you knew, to hear their voice, and to have it happen in person as it were, as opposed to over a screen, and somebody that you knew as opposed to somebody that you didn't know, it is all the more disconcerting. So while a child of God cannot be unborn, because all who are born of God overcome the world, 1 John 5, 4. And while the justified cannot become the condemned, because all who are justified will be glorified, Romans chapter 8, verse 30. Nonetheless, to use language from Hebrews 6, a person can experience some measure of enlightenment, they can partake in some ministry of the Holy Spirit without being indwelt by Him. They can taste the good Word of God, the powers of the age to come, and the heavenly gift without being saved. I mean, you see that quite clearly in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, and then in verse 9, when the writer of Hebrews says, But we expect better things for you, brethren, the things that accompany salvation. That's fearful. But when you think about it, what would you expect the seed that lands upon the rocky soil and or the seed that gets choked out by the thorns to look like? It would look like that. Jesus essentially said as much in the parable of the sower. 
and Paul will address that subject in our text, setting before us a primary pathway through which people enter into the land of apostasy. So having most recently described the mission and message of the church, that's what we saw Paul do essentially in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. Paul proceeded to provide both warning and instruction for Timothy, for the church at Ephesus, and by extension us. We begin in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, where we read, But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Now immediately you can see that the dangerous nature of the false teaching spoken of here is accented by the fact that the Spirit explicitly warned about it. He, the Spirit of truth, neither wastes words nor warnings. And anyone who has ears to hear needs to hear the clear call of this warning. That word explicitly that's used there in the Greek is the word retos. It means explicitly, clearly, in stated terms. This was a clear warning from the Spirit of God. Furthermore, you can feel the forthcoming contrast in light of, namely, what came before. Think of what just came before, right? That glorious Christ hymn. He was manifested in the flesh. He was vindicated by the Spirit. He was seen by angels. He was believed on in the world. He was taken up to glory. You have, you have this amazing Christ hymn that, that's told to us right before that. And then all of a sudden, you get to the first word of our English text here, and it's the Greek word day. But, and you can kind of feel the contrast that's coming. As though to say, yes, the church has been given the treasure of the truth of who Christ is, as well depicted in the Christ hymn. But many, like dogs chasing after the sight, the sound, and the smell of treats, will go after the offerings held out to them by false teachers. And they will, as the scripture says here, fall away from the faith. Now again... Yes, per the Christ hymn, Jesus was believed on in the world, which was a testimony to the message's efficacy. He was believed on in the world. But just because he would be believed on by many did not mean that some who appeared to believe would turn away from the faith they temporarily professed. Apostasy is no doubt to be lamented. When I heard about my friend falling away from the faith, it is to be lamented. It is a sad, heartbreaking thing. But I want you to notice that the Spirit's words are predictive. So the church that is really the church, when somebody falls away from the faith, the church that is really the church should not become discouraged as though the message of Christ was deficient. Rather, the falling away of some is a confirmation, if you will, a witness to the veracity of the truth of God. Because God's word promised that some who appeared to be following Jesus, appeared to be believing in Jesus, would fall away. So rather than the church saying, what's going on? What's wrong? Is there something wrong with our message? Is there something wrong with the gospel that we're preaching? Is it deficient in some way? Did they find something, some hole in it that I've missed all this time? No, actually, their departure from the faith is a witness to the faith and a confirmation of God's word. If you think about that, that predicted reality should lead every believer in this room to hold even more tightly to the invisible hand that is holding them, you. Now, the Spirit-inspired prediction of apostasy is witnessed to quite a few times in Scripture. Jesus, you might remember, who ministered in the power of the Spirit, he warned of deception and apostasy during the Olivet Discourse. The Apostle Paul told the church of Thessalonica, both in person and in writing that there would be a great falling away, a kind of defection of great magnitude that would precede the Lord's coming. You can see that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 12. But apostasy is not limited to the last of the last days. 
I mean, think about what the Apostle Paul told the Ephesian elders before he left. He told them apostasy is basically going to happen among you. There's going to be men among you who are going to arise and they're going to draw away disciples onto themselves speaking perverse things. So it's not something that's limited to the last of the last days, even though it might reach a kind of crescendo, if you will, in those days. In 1 Timothy 4.1, Paul may be, to quote one commentator, speaking about a present phenomenon using emphatic future language characteristic of prophecy. Whatever the case, it's very clear that Paul wanted Timothy to make sure that the church at Ephesus knew this exact warning. You find that out in chapter 4, verse 6. In pointing these things out to the brethren, the stuff that I just told you. So make sure, Timothy, you tell them about the stuff that I just told you, yet alone the stuff that preceded it. Now, look at the expression, later times. The expression, later times, is essentially biblical shorthand for the time in between Jesus' first coming and second coming. Peter, for instance, said that Christ appeared, quote, in these last times for the sake of you, the church. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. The writer of Hebrews said, quote, in these last days... God, so I'm just going to insert God because he was referencing God earlier. In these last days, God has spoken to us in his son. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2. John told his readers, children, it is the last hour. 1 John chapter 2 verse 18. So when you hear later times, last days, that's biblical shorthand for the time in between Jesus' two advents. In between the first coming and the second coming of Christ. And now each of those writers that I just referenced, each of them speak about apostasy happening and the possibility of it happening within their current contexts. Just to provide some quotes and some references, Peter warned that false teachers would secretly bring in destructive heresies and that many would follow them. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. He even goes on in verse 20 to describe such men as apostates who previously escaped the corruption that was in the world, i.e., they had some measure of moral reformation without experiencing spiritual regeneration. So they, they were these teachers, they got cleaned up a little bit, they had some sort of moral regeneration, but they never had spiritual regeneration. And you can see that in Peter's proverb at the end of chapter 2. He says, it has happened to them so as to fulfill the proverb, the dog goes back to its own vomit. And the pig, after having been cleaned, returns to the mire. Why? Because what the pig needed was not just the outward washing. The pig needed a change of nature. So an apostate, you can clean up an apostate, they can make this temporary profession, and you can clean them up on the outside, but at the end of the day, if they do not have a change of nature, they are going to inevitably do something like that. Return to their old ways in some way, shape, or form, or cleverly keep their inward passions hidden, at least from some. Well, the writer of Hebrews gives an example of this. He warned his readers to take care lest there be found in them, quote, an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Hebrews 3.12. So again, it was a first century possibility too. Like, guys, be careful. Be careful that there be not among you an unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Why? Because you have wheat and tares among the assembly. And part of the way that the sheep are going to continue to grow, the sheep are going to grow by hearing the warnings because they hear the voice of their shepherd through the warning. And they're like, yeah, I, I don't want that ever to be me. I know it can't be me because I am saved by grace, but I don't want to take that for granted. I want to pursue holiness and the things of God. But then there will be goats. And that warning will only serve to make their judgment all the more in light of the gracious outstretched hand of God to them that they refused to hear. John said that there were those among the church that went out from the church but they were never really of the church. 1 John chapter 2 verse 19. So at the risk of reiteration and oversimplification to borrow some language from Walter Liefeld the last days 
i.e. the period in between Christ's two advents, two comings, is characterized by the pouring out of God's Spirit on men and women of different ages, as well as the presence of those who reject the truth during that time, some of whom will have previously professed allegiance to it. And just as Paul, and notice this as well, and just as Paul used the active, indicative, present verb lege, translated in our text as says, to speak of the Spirit's communication. So he uses lege here, Spirit says, speaks of the Spirit's current communication. We would do well to remember this, that what the Spirit said is what the Spirit is saying. A little bit later on in this epistle, Paul is going to quote previously written scripture. He's going to use the same word, lege. He's going to say the scripture says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18. And the principle is this, and we saw this play out in Jesus' view of scripture when we were going through the gospel of Luke. You could see this play out something like this. What scripture has said is what the scripture is saying. And what the Spirit has said through the Scripture is what the Spirit continues to say. And that's not an excuse for somebody to go and just wrench Scripture out of its context and make inappropriate applications thinking that the Spirit is saying things that He never said because somebody misunderstood and misapplied the passage. No. But the Word of God is living and active. And that should add some zest to your devotional time. When you're reading the scriptures, think about this. When you're reading the scriptures, you're not just reading. But the Spirit, through the scripture, is speaking. Speaking to you right through the word. Helping you hear the clear warnings. Yes, within a proper grid of interpret interpretive principles, right? Because you can think the Spirit's saying something that he's clearly not saying. So you want to make sure you have a proper understanding of how to interpret text within its context and using the proper tools at your disposal and then making application to yourself. But nonetheless, the Word of God is living and active. And when you're reading, you're not just reading through the Spirit-inspired text. The Spirit is speaking. Amazing. And what the Spirit was saying here has already been alluded to. Some will fall away from the faith. And that word for fall away, it's a conjugated form of the word aphistemi right here, essentially means to apostatize. It means to depart from. In other words, some people, after making an outward turn to the faith, would eventually turn away from the faith. They are like Judas, who, although he was a disciple, was nonetheless, to use language from Jesus, a devil. And although he was one of the twelve, was nonetheless a son of perdition. And you can see that in Luke 22, verse 3, he was one of the twelve, son of perdition, John 17, verse 12. Now it's important because Judas' closeness to Jesus and to the faith was more a matter of proximity than reality. All right? He was close to Jesus, like literally, but he wasn't close to Jesus relationally. He was nonetheless a devil and the son of perdition. And his apostasy, this is important for you to understand, his apostasy was not a reversing of the work of the Spirit. It never is. I mean, that's what Jesus said. I chose you, but one he knew from the beginning was a devil. It wasn't a matter of reversing the work of the Spirit. Apostasy never is. Like all apostasy, it is the inevitable outworking, to use language from Jesus in Luke chapter 8, verse 13. It's the inevitable outworking of someone who believes for a while, yet has no root. Language right from Jesus to describe that kind of person. They believe with a kind of pseudo-faith for a while, but it doesn't last because they have no root. You need a category for that. Otherwise, you're going to throw off your understanding of the Spirit's work in the life of a believer. Because you're going to think that He might seal you today, unseal you tomorrow. You might think that God gives you new life today, and then He takes away new life tomorrow. You might think that you're justified today, and then you're condemned tomorrow. If you don't understand the reality that there is a category for apostasy, people who profess it outwardly, but have never been changed inwardly. 
If you just run through all the references that you just got in the first however many minutes of this message, it begins to set before you quite a theology of understanding that in its proper context. And you need that so you can appreciate what you have in the gospel, what you have in the ministry of the Spirit, and so you don't misunderstand the falling away that you may see around you. Well, how does this falling away happen? Or to put it another way, what is the anatomy of apostasy? There are a couple of layers provided in this passage. First, we are told, looking at the text, that it comes by paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. So an essential step, if somebody's going to walk down the path of apostasy, an essential step is to give heed to, to listen to, to pay attention to deceitful spirits instead of the Holy Spirit. Now this is interesting because when you look at the false religious systems of this world, the false religions of this world, you could look at them and they could just look like the simple product of men's error. That's what it might look like. But although the mind of fallen man is an idol factory, it's as though the devil and his demons provide the raw materials out of which emerge the idol and its religious system. That's essentially the picture that's painted here. That false doctrine is invented by demons. It's the picture you have painted in this verse. And then is, as it were, given to men to propagate. Think about that. To be a herald of false teaching is to be an evangelist of Satan. Now, when people look back at the work of someone like Joseph Goebbels, he was a skilled orator, skilled speaker, who worked closely alongside of Adolf Hitler. He was one of his closest associates. He was a Nazi propagandist. When people look back at somebody like that, they don't typically, I wouldn't think by and large, celebrate his life and work. Because they would see him as somebody who advocated discrimination and advocated extermination. So people, even in the, even in the mind of culture, even in fallen society, people are looking back at him and saying, you know, that's the kind of guy that we hold in high esteem. People recognize, okay, no, that, that's wicked and that's evil. And even if that man did, like, things that society thinks are really nice, even if he took in lost puppies and just took care of them, even if he helped old ladies across the street, even if he worked in a soup kitchen, it wouldn't matter because people at the end of the day would say, you've aligned yourself with Adolf Hitler, who to many is essentially the personification of evil. Now our culture, even fallen man, gets that. But it's interesting because... When you look at the propagation of false teachings, people are quick to not think of those in the same way. Meaning this, it's so outwardly grotesque to be affiliated with the philosophy of Nazi Germany that even an unbeliever can say, if you're going to advocate that kind of discrimination and extermination, we see that for what it is. It is evil. But well, you have to understand that if somebody is going to advocate, advocate and propagate false teachings, they've aligned themselves with someone who is even more the personification of evil than Hitler was. They've aligned themselves with Satan, who is the father of lies. I mean, understanding this provides a sense of sobriety. False teachers may not wear swastikas and their religious system may not be as outwardly grotesque as the philosophy behind Nazi Germany, but to teach lies that do not line up with scripture is to be a devoted newsie and a passionate propagandist of somebody who is more personification of evil than even Hitler was, Satan, the father of lies. Per the text, we see that Satan does not work alone. You see it right in the text. Deceitful spirits and demons are engaged in this labor of lying. They are the powers and principalities that are referenced in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. They are the ones who are behind idol worship and false religions. You could reference a bunch of texts for that. 1 Corinthians 10, 
verses 21 and 22, Leviticus 17, 7. Deuteronomy 32, 17, Psalm 106, verses 36 and 37. And furthermore, when you go through the scriptures, they're not only portrayed as originators of false doctrine like they're portrayed as right here, but they are to some degree animators of the false teachers. You could look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, behind a false prophet is a lying spirit. And there are other examples that can be given. And their deception takes the form of doctrine. Greek word essentially meaning teaching. It's not so much teaching with respect to demons, but it's teaching that comes from demons. Now think about it. False teachings come in all kinds of flavors. It's like jelly beans, right? There's so many flavors of jelly beans. There's just like more than you can count. Well, it's kind of like that with false teachings. You could have naturalistic atheism. You could have an emotionally charged universalism where everybody's going to heaven. You could have a kind of harsh asceticism where people think they have to beat their body and do all these things to kind of earn righteousness in the sight of God. You can have a biblical truth mingled with antichrist error kind of theology. The mix and match list could go on and on. And it's so important for you to understand because we know that Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. But a primary way through which he devours is through false doctrine, false teaching, false teachers, and lies. A lot of people have that picture. Satan's like a roaring lion seeking to be devour. But they don't understand that a primary way through which he is devouring people is not by going into some physical confrontation with them one-on-one. -on -one. It's by deceiving them through religious systems, through philosophies, through antichrist error mingled in with scriptural truth. And he's devouring people through that. And don't forget that his ministers will often masquerade themselves as ministers of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 11.15 I mean, if all false teachers looked like Dark Sidious, you know Dark Sidious, right? The emperor from the Star Wars series. I mean, if all false teachers came and they sounded like him and they looked like him and they heralded the message that went something like this, worship Satan and assure the condemnation of your souls. Even unbelieving men and women, out of a sense of self-preservation, yet alone some innate sense of right and wrong, would say, I'm going to reject that invitation. No, thank you. But he doesn't come like that. False teachers don't come like that. They come more like the white witch from the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Offering to satisfy the sweet tooth cravings of men and women with the Turkish delight of lies and false teachings. That's how they come. So please note, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more in verse 2. Please note, a nice smile does not make for a, sh a safe shepherd. <laughs> I mean, wolves so often dress in the best of sheep's clothing. You want to take note of what they're speaking and what they're teaching. That's what you evaluate. It's not the end of your evaluation, as you'll see in verse 2, or as you have already seen in 1 Timothy 3. But you want to take note of what they're saying, not how they're smiling. Well, Paul will give some specific examples of what these demonic teachings include, and I find that very instructive, but we're going to get to that, Lord willing, next week. But for now, look at verse 2, where we see the kind of individuals through whom these teachings will so often come. Verse 2 reads, By means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Now this verse describes the kind of individuals through whom false doctrine, demonic doctrine, is so often pervade. Namely, to get at the Greek word that's used here, hypocritical lie speakers. That's essentially what's going on here. Hypocritical lie speakers. First, they engage in hypocrisy. They play act. They have, if you will, traded the stage for the church. They pretend to be something that they're not. They pretend to be what they don't intend to become. That's what they do. They lie. They live a lie. 
But even if they were genuine, even if they were genuine in their devotion to their religious system, living in accordance with the lies that they teach, they would nonetheless be liars. Because they would be in the business of propagating demonic doctrine as though it were sound doctrine, misrepresenting God's truth. But as is so often the case, they not only teach lies, as we see in verse 2, they live a lie. This isn't anything new. You can go in the Old Testament and you could see God speaking through the prophet of Jeremiah, God giving his evaluation, by and large, of the prophets and priests of Jeremiah's day, saying that from the greatest to the least of them, they practiced deceit. Jeremiah 6.13, and were ungodly. Jeremiah 23, verse 11. In like manner, Jesus said that the religious leaders of his day honored God with their lips, but their hearts were far from him. Mark chapter 7, verse 6. They appeared righteous to people, but inwardly they were full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Matthew 23, verse 8. Paul also spoke of false teachers who professed to know God, yet in their actions they denied him. Titus chapter 1, verse 16. All of the aforementioned had this in common, have this in common, had and have this in common. They were not what they appeared to be. I don't know, take for, I don't think many of you have, so I'll tell you about it. Some of you might have seen the toy that has been somewhat in demand in recent months called Feisty Pets. It's a rather disturbing toy, in my opinion. It looks like a cute little stuffed animal. And then upon squeezing it, I think you squeeze it, and then all of a sudden its face changes from a face to like a kind of, it's all of a sudden its previously hidden fangs show. And so all of a sudden it's like, this, oh, it's like a cute puppy, and then you squeeze it, and all of a sudden like fangs come out, you're like, whoa, what is that? And there are, there are videos out there of like parents and dogs and cats being scared by these little stuffed animals that look so nice, and all of a sudden when you squeeze them, you see their fangs, and you see what they really are. When you think of false teachers, you should think of feisty pets. Because that's essentially what's going on there. They smile, tell you something that you want to hear, don't tell you a whole bunch that you probably wouldn't want to hear, smile. Maybe if you poke them the wrong way with some sound doctrine, their fangs come out. Maybe if you're a reporter and you ask them about their jet, they get a little mad. I've seen that happen a couple times. And all of a sudden you start to see the fangs begin to come out. But even if they didn't show you the fangs, they're there. And how do you know they're there? You know it through the false teaching. You don't have to see the fangs to know that the fangs are there. Because you could tell by the teaching. But so often, the life will be in correlation with the false teaching. Right? You just may not see it. It may be hidden to some degree, depending on how close you are to whoever this individual might be. But I tell you this, do not be fooled by their garb, by their smiles, by their manner, by their credentials, by their charisma, by their following. In one way or another, behind the sheep's clothing is a fang of a wolf. So you want to be aware of all those seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. We'll talk about some specifically as Paul unpacks some examples next week. But at this point, you could ask this question. Some of you may be asking this question right now. How do they do it? Not like in an impressed way, like, how do they do it? But like in this like shocked way, like, how do they do it? How do they go living the lie? Some of you have a problem believing that they are actually false teachers because you just don't understand how they could do what they're doing. You're like, no, they can't be false teachers because I just don't understand how they could do that. Paul gives you an answer right here as to how they do that. Look at the text. They are seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. That word seared essentially sounds like our English word cauterized. It's as though a hot branding iron. Now that word in the Greek, it can mean, it can mean either of two things here. It could mean, it could speak of being branded, i.e. as in marked as belonging to Satan in the same way that a rancher would brand cattle. So that word that's used here could speak of that. I think it's more likely that this meaning is being spoken of here. Speaking of something being cauterized, as say with a hot iron, cauterized so that the flesh is seared and nerve endings are deadened, rendering a person without feeling in that area. 
That's what's being spoken of here. So if you say, how, how do they do this? They don't feel it anymore. You're feeling it. Because you're like, how can they tell everybody if you just believe you are going to be healed? At the end of the day, it's up to you. And if you didn't get it, if your family member didn't get it, you have failed. If you don't get money in your bank account or coming from somewhere, you have failed for not believing. And you're thinking, how could they do this? They must not realize it. And it's right. They don't realize it in most cases, or at least some cases. But the reason why they don't know it or don't feel it and the damage that it does to so many people, or whether it's purveying a false religious system and saying, travel to this place and worship our gods, or partake of this self-denial to reach enlightenment. And the reason they don't feel the weightiness of that evil is because their conscience has been seared as though with a hot iron. Just don't feel it. They've sinned against the light of their better judgment so much that it's deadened feeling to the area of their conscience. That's scary. It's a scary place to be, especially because the person that's there doesn't know that they are there. They don't know they're there. You can avoid getting to that place in part by knowing how somebody gets there and avoiding that path. How do you get there? You get there by keep if you keep committing offenses against your conscience and your better knowledge and you keep doing things that you believe to be wrong and over time it will, as, it will be as though you have taken a hot branding iron, iron to the skin of your conscience and you've deadened feeling to it. The Pharisees lived in that place. That's where they lived. But supposed Christ followers... And even those who are truly Christ followers need to hear that warning as well. Jesus spoke a parable about a pseudo-servant. A servant, it was, about, it was about a good servant, and it was about a pseudo-servant as well. But speaking about the pseudo-servant, this pseudo-servant identified the Lord as his master within the parable. He identified the Lord as his, as his master, yet he was an unbeliever that was ultimately assigned a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 24, verse 51. Well, why is Pastor George telling us this? Because the warning for false teachers isn't just for false teachers, ultimately. It's for professing Christ followers. You look at that parable, Jesus is speaking about somebody who said, I'm a follower of Jesus. That's essentially who this man is supposed to be within the parable. He is a supposed servant. But Jesus says he's going to be assigned a place with the hypocrites. Where is that place? It's in the lake of fire where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And you want to avoid going down that path. Well, how do you do that? Well, I do think, I'm not going to unpack that entire parable, but I do think if you were to read that parable, it's super short. Matthew 24 begins at verse 45. You could learn from the believing servant when you contrast him with the unbelieving servant. If you want to avoid going down that path, you look at what the believing servant does here and you'll be instructed how to be a wise servant. Quickly, just kind of picking some thoughts from that parable. Like the faithful servant in the, in the parable, you should see yourself as a temporary steward of gifts and responsibilities for which you are accountable. You keep living in light of that. You fight against the grain of independence and you realize that you are dependent and that you are somebody who will give an account to the God who has given you what he has given you. So you live in light of your stewardship. You live in light of the fact that your master is returning and his physical absence is temporary. You live in light of that. How do you get protected from going down that path? You live in light of the fact that your master's absence physically, his physical bodily presence is temporary and he is going to be returning. You preoccupy yourself with your master's work, being cognizant that he knows and he weighs your motives. You see that not only from the parable, but you can see that in Proverbs 16.2 and Proverbs 21.2. And that D, if you didn't know, I had those itemized. So it was like A, B, C, and this is D. Upon his return, he will inspect your work and reward you accordingly. That's what the unbelieving servant didn't do. He's like, my master's gone. Who knows when he's coming back? Party, let's go. Party and beatings, that's what he did. So it was like party, beatings, and the wise servant lives in light of the fact that I'm, I'm a steward. 
It's temporary. I am accountable to my master. He is going to come and inspect my work. As a matter of fact, he's inspecting what I'm doing right now. So you're living in light of that. But perhaps you'll find this timely and destructive. Negatively stated, to avoid the fearful prospect of a seared conscience, if you think about that long enough, it should produce sensitivity. How do you avoid it? Simply put, the fearful prospect of a seared conscience in itself should produce in you sensitivity. What do I mean? If you're not sensitive to the things that you watch, for instance, you will become increasingly okay with looking at things that you shouldn't. If you're not sensitive to the words you speak, you'll become progressively careless with the words that you say. If you're not sensitive to the relationships you make, you may make friendships with the world not realizing that you have some measure of now conflict with God. If you're not sensitive to use what God has given you, you'll likely steward it unwisely and recklessly instead of carefully. If you're not sensitive to make a priority of corporate worship specifically or the things of God generally, it's a matter of time until those things fall to the periphery. If you don't make it a priority, it will fall to the periphery. If you're not sensitive as to how you apply your Christian liberty, and if you're not sensitive to the possibility that you might use another Christian's decision to justify your own, you might not realize that you're stepping into the shallow end of worldliness, only to soon find yourself and perhaps people that you love swimming in the deep end. You are called not to be callous. You are called to be sensitive. Sensitive. You don't want to propagate the doctrines of demons, no. But neither do you want to drift into the hypocritical path of their agents. You are not to be Satan's mouthpiece, no. But you're also not to be his billboard. You are to live carefully before the gracious eyes of the one before whom you will give an account. Giving heed to sound doctrine and exhibiting your belief in it by adherence to it. That's what you are called to do. You are called to live carefully. Freedom in Christ does not mean careless living for Christ. The two are not equal. You have freedom in Christ, yes. But you are called to live carefully before the gracious eyes of the one before whom you will give an account. And your greatest motivation for doing this, by the way, is not the assurance that comes with obedience, although that is precious. And there is increased measures of assurance that comes with obedience, the confidence that you've escaped from the wrath to come. The greatest motivation is the cross, by which you have been crucified to the world and the world to you. It is the cross upon which your Savior hung as a curse as he demonstrated his love for you and as the love of God was demonstrated towards you. It is the cross by which he disarmed powers and principalities and reconciled you to God. It is the cross. You look at the cross, you look at the love of God displayed in Christ on the cross, and that becomes your motivation for sensitive living. It's not a legalistic thing. It's a love thing. It's a why I want to honor him thing. It's a look at what he did kind of thing, and I want to let leverage my life for him. I want to obey him. I want to follow him. I want to live carefully because he is the bridegroom and I am the bride. It's driven by the gospel. It's driven by love. It's not about preserving my salvation. It's about working out the salvation that God has worked in. It's not about trying to get God to love me. Maybe he'll love me more if I do better this week. It's about responding to the fact that he loves me with a love that surpasses knowledge. Therefore, I want to follow him. I take up my cross because he took up the cross for me. That's my motivation for cross-bearing. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus told disciples, by extension, tells us. And we do that because he first loved us. Amazing. Now, through the Spirit's work of regeneration and through the cross, you are being renewed in the image of your creator. That's awesome. You have an image to bear, but it's not a mask. 
some timely but false representation of who you want others to perceive yourself to be. You have an image to bear. You are to bear the image of the Savior who loved you and gave himself for you. By God's grace, you refuse to be different things to different groups of people because you love the one who loved you and gave himself for you. And hypocrisy, you know, in light of hearing this message, you know, hypocrisy not only betrays a fearful state of one's soul, in the case of a professing Christian, it distorts the image of the one who suffered at the hands of hypocrites so as to save you from all of your sin and all of your hypocrisy. You have come to a Savior who died for all of your hypocrisy. So you need not live as a hypocrite anymore. What a gospel. The Savior dying for sinners like us. And if you haven't received it, I encourage you, that is great news. Whatever your sins are, whatever they may be, though they are many, the mercy of the cross is more. Come to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remove the mask. Bow the knee. Receive Christ as Savior. Believe in Him for the forgiveness of sins. See Him as the resurrected Savior who resurrected for your justification. See Him as the only way to the Father. And thank Him for dying for all of your sins. Though they are many, His mercy is more. That is good news. So come. If you haven't come, maybe today will be that day where you profess Christ for the first time and you bow the knee and you say, I believe he died for my sins, suffered the curse of God's wrath for my hypocrisy. Having seen a description of who the false teachers were, and Lord willing, next week we'll see a sampling of what they taught. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. Even as we look at the description given to us of these false teachers, we know, Heavenly Father, that throughout the course of our lives, we have sinned against our better judgment. We have sinned against the light of your word. We, Heavenly Father, have spoken things that are untrue in our lives. We have misrepresented you in one way or another. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that we get to celebrate this afternoon not our own moral reformation, we get to celebrate the work of a Savior who died for our salvation. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the one who perfectly represented you. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit so that we might be renewed into the image of our Creator, that we might be conformed to the image of Christ, that we might better represent the one who loved us and gave himself for all of our sin and all of our hypocrisy. Father, I pray for us as a church that you will continue to protect us, not only corporately, but individually, those who are gathered in this building, protect us from walking down the path of Satan's hypocritical agents. Help us to have an appropriate, sensitive, uh, an appropriate sensitivity to honoring you. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would continue to help us to feed upon the words of truth to reject the false teachings of the doctrines of demons and seducing spirits, but to keep in step with the Holy Spirit, with His ministry, even as He speaks to us through the text of Scripture. We thank You for You nourishing us through it. We love You, and we pray these things, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.